and this one is called The State of Super Villainy. <laughs> oh, goody. Now you got you got a one, two, three, dun dun dun. Ready? One, two, three. Dun dun dun! I love you guys. You're <laughs> so awesome. All right, ready when you are. Please state your name and occupation. I am Albert Vernon, and I'm a super villain analyst for Smithfield Tyson Baker, which specializes in asset management for high value clients. Why would such a company have a super villain analyst? Well, obviously, on behalf of our clients, we have business and financial interests all over the world, and super villains, intentionally or unintentionally, have an impact on our investments and ongoing business concerns. Someone needs to track what these villains are up to, and if they will ad adversely affect our asset management. Can you give us an example? Uh, say we're thinking of investing in a tin mine in Peru. One of the things we do is fund an archaeological survey of the surrounding area to see if there are any Inca ruins or burial sites around. Those things are super villain magnets. They like to comb through them for mystical objects of power or, or for portals to demonic planes. And this affects you how? Well, lots of ways. First, as long as they're in the neighborhood, they'll send some henchmen over for looting. That's an extra security cost. If the mine is actually above or very near the ruins, the villain might try to take over the entire mine as a secret lair. That's either even more security or, alternately, additional lawyers to hammer out the terms of the lease. <laughs> Finally, in the highly unlikely event that a supervillain does, in fact, open a portal to the demon planes, we have to deal with that. More security. No, more lawyers. <laughs> you can't stop demons, but you can reach settlements with families of demon-consumed miners. Well, fair enough. So tell us, what is the current state of supervillainy on the planet? Well, frankly, it's in a bit of a depression. It seems that the current economic crisis would be perfect for supervillainy. Yeah. Well, to the layman, sure, it seems that way. But, in fact, basic natural, political, or economic chaos is not a supervillain's friend. I'll give you an example. Last year, the supervillain Colonel Unbelievable was working on a master plan to destabilize the Icelandic Kronor, depressing its value and allowing him to snap up the country and use its geothermal energy to build an army of killer mecha droids. But before he could launch the plan, the country's three blank banks went belly up as a natural consequence of being over leveraged. The same plan, but accidental. Not accidental, just stupid. <laughs> but, and, and this is key, there was no supervillain plan behind it, so from the supervillain point of view, this was a completely wasted effort. And because Colonel Unbelievable had himself over leveraged his own assets to fund the destabilization effort, he went bankrupt just like Iceland. Now the only thermal energy he's using comes out of the prison shower. <laughs> and that's not nearly enough for a mecha droid army. Unbelievable. Yes, and given the colonel's name, ironic. <laughs> but he did us a favor. Since we were aware of his supervillain plans well in advance, we were quietly able to extract our own investments out of the Icelandic banks before the crash. And now you see the value of having a supervillain analyst. <laughs> Well, how did you know about Colonel Unbelievable's plan ahead of time? Well, that's proprietary information. <laughs> Let's just say our information collection budget is significant. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that if you knew about the plan, why didn't you tell Iceland about it? <laughs> <laughs> They're not one of our clients. <laughs> well, even so, it seems like something you might want to share with someone. Well, again, to the layman. But look... <laughs> Iceland's three blank banks had their own analysts. I can't tell you if they factored in supervillains into their own investment risk analysis, but if they didn't, how is this the problem of Smithfield, Tyson, Baker, or its clients? <laughs> Legally, we're in the clear. Just ask the SEC. But you knew an entire country was about to go under. It just feels a little insider traitory, you know? I see what you're saying. I resent it. <laughs> But there are two things here. First, in fact, a supervillain did not bring down Iceland. Simple, non-supervillainous banker greed did. Ethically, we're in the clear. Second, we didn't know if Colonel Unbelievable was going to succeed. We just knew he had plans. You have to, you have to understand that most quote-unquote supervillains 
are in fact spectacularly incompetent. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, think about it. Well, how often is an army of killer mecha droids actually unleashed on the planet? Can you can you name the last time? I have to admit, I'm drawing a blank. January first, two thousand four. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. I think I would remember that. Every single float in the Rose Parade <laughs> was, in fact, a killer mecha droid. <laughs> The plan was to rise up and at the precise moment in time assassinate the entire USC football team at the Rose Bowl, thus forcing a forfeit to Michigan. That's, um, that, that's a pretty small bore use of killer mechadroid army. Well, the plan was masterminded by the Scarlet Wolverine. <laughs> Michigan fan, what are you going to do? <laughs> but after that, then the mecha droids were going to stomp down to the San Onofre nuclear generating station and cause a meltdown. But none of that happened. The San Onofre reactors are fine. And USC beat Michigan 28-14. to 14. <laughs> Because the Scarlet Wolverine outsourced his mecha droid system code creation to a bunch of shady programmers. Rather than write up new code, they just delivered a stack of chips taken out of Tickle Me Elmo toys. <laughs> so instead of rising up and slaughtering Matt Leinart, the floats just vibrated slightly and let out high-pitched squeals of joy. <laughs> Which is horrible in itself. <laughs> Granted, but not like Chernobyl on the Pacific would have been. But, but this is my point. The overwhelming majority of supervillain plans fail, and fail hard. We weren't too concerned about Colonel Unbelievable actually bringing down Iceland. The man is zero for 14 in his supervillain plans. He didn't take over Liberia either, which he had planned the year before. He also didn't re revive the zombie Jefferson Davis. <laughs> didn't turn the world's oceans to marshmallow. And didn't release Guns N' Roses' long-delayed Chinese democracy album. <laughs> All of which were on his schedule. Chinese democracy did get released, though. Yes, but not with subliminal sonic pain generators encoded onto the tracks. Some would argue. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> the point is, Colonel Unbelievable wasn't involved. And just because he and other people call themselves supervillains doesn't mean they actually do a good job at what they do. <laughs> When I turn in a risk assessment, it's very rarely about the consequences of the whole earth being destroyed or enslaved or being turned into gum or whatever. It's about, well, this character is going to be a minor nuisance at a tin mine. We might as well hire two night watchmen instead, instead of one. Got it. Well, what else can you tell us about the current state of supervillainy? Well, the economic situation of the planet is affecting supervillains in other ways. Most notably, where their secret layers are. The classic hidden volcanic island in the South Pacific, for example, is very much out these days. I would imagine Google Earth took away a lot of the secrecy. Yes. <laughs> Once echo tourists start geocaching your lair with their Android phones, it's all over. <laughs> but it's more that they're just so expensive. I mean, there aren't that many islands with active volcanoes, for one. So the market's overinflated. But more than that, it's the cost of shipping. It takes tons of money just to ship basics like food and dry goods. Add to that shipping charges for a laser that can etch the moon or a robot capable of crushing a skyscraper. It all begins to add up. Infrastructure is expensive. So now we're seeing a lot of smaller, cheaper layers. Old bowling alleys, barns, former Kmarts. <laughs> Their mom's basement? You've heard about the Chevy Destroyer, I see. <laughs> what about minions? I would think that rising unemployment would mean it's easier to find lackeys and lick boots and such. Well, yes and no. Certainly it's easier to find unskilled muscle these days, and even some white-collar help. Uh, the layoffs in banking and publishing have made for a glut in money, money laundering vil experts and villain monologue writers. <laughs> But the top level of help, we're talking mad scientists and assassins here, are still difficult and expensive to get. A good ninja is hard to find. Well, yes, actually, that's, that's the whole point with them. Right. Although... <laughs> as 
as it happens, ninjas are on their way out as the skilled muscle and assassin class. Why is that? Because well, everyone has ninjas these days, don't they? They've just become so common. You can't walk down the street without bumping into a ninja. I mean, metaphorically speaking, anyway, since they're usually <laughs> hanging from a lamp pole or jumping across a roof or something. But uh, that's the problem. Everyone's expecting ninjas. <laughs> People these days are surprised if there are not ninjas. And obviously, that's an issue for surprise attacks. So, what's replacing ninjas? Janissaries. Janissaries. <laughs> That's right, Janissaries. As in the shock troops for the Ottoman Empire from the 15th through the 19th century? The very ones. Why then? <laughs> Why not? The Janissaries are highly competent uh, soldiers and killers, feared in their day, and they have fabulous uniforms. Really, it's a great look. And all of these are key for a supervillain, particularly the uniforms, since it means a supervillain doesn't have to reach into his own pocket to kick them out. It's a small thing, but in these days of economic distress, these little things add up. I'm just wondering where they've been keeping themselves since the early 1800s. Where did all the ninjas come from? <laughs> <laughs> They've been around. They're just waiting, and now is their time. At least until everyone expects an attack from a turbaned warrior in the pay of a supervillain. Well, uh, yes. I mean, ultimately, it's a fashion thing. Spandex and capes are also out this year. And I, I note this all in an appendix to my annual supervillain assessment report. So, even though it's a bad time for supervillains, you expect them to keep at it? Well, of course. Like everything, the field has its ups and its downs, but it, it never goes away. I mean, I think we're going to see some, some breakout stars in the field. Gunthar, the Claw of the East, for example, took over the Gulprish district of Abkhazia in Georgia. Did it last summer armed only with a cannon that fired highly acidic yogurt. That is pretty impressive. <laughs> I, I didn't hear about that. Well, shortly thereafter, Russia invaded Georgia. That kind of stole his thunder. <laughs> then he ran out of yogurt. It's always something. It's uh, yogurts for eating, not for killing. Unless you're a supervillain. Well, it keeps me employed, at least. Ever think of crossing to the other side and trying supervillainy yourself? No. You know, I already worked for Enron. Once is enough. 